hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutor Star Course Series, where we are live in the Amazon rainforest you see right there. And we are going to get an expert tour from one of the greatest Amazonian tour guides of all time, Phil Torres. You know him from Discovery Channel, National Geographic, all kinds of incredible projects. He's been exploring the Amazon and maybe he's been exploring it too long. Phil, we, uh, we're doing a class right now, man. You out there? He's... He's on his way in. Maybe while we wait for him, I'll give you some instructions. When he's back from exploring, there he is. He'll want to hear from you. So use the chat box early and often have some cameras ready so you can take some pictures. But he's been getting ready for this class for a while. So let me turn it over to your teacher for today, Phil Torres. Brian, I'm sorry. I'm a little bit late. Um, I just saw this amazing butterfly back there on the rainforest. So I had to go catch it to show everybody. Whew, good thing I brought my butterfly net today. Um, let me see if I can get it out and show you because this is this is an incredible, oh my goodness, butterfly. Let me see, let me see. Ooh, I think I got it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, look at this. This is a butterfly called Panacea. That's the genus of it. And one of my absolute favorites here because you see the underside, look how red that is. Unbelievable color. And the upper side, this is where it gets really, really amazing. And also, I've been handling butterflies since I was about 10 years old. So I know how to do this in a way that doesn't hurt it. Look at that color. Look at that shimmer. Is that amazing or what? What is the timing? I love it. Um, now, in true Amazon fashion, my favorite way of releasing butterflies back into the rainforest is sticking it on my face and putting it on my nose and we'll see what it does. Maybe it'll stick around and I can uh, you know, get to it with a, a companion. Let me see, is it gonna behave? <laughs> Look at that. Are you guys able to see the color? Wow, it might take off. There it goes. That's amazing. Um, wow. Okay. Well, prior to the little uh, butterfly interruption, but I just had to show everybody that. What do you say we get to today's Amazon adventure? Um, well, Brian, I'm not hearing you, but I'm going to get to it um, because we got a lot to talk about today. So I wanna first talk about the different sections that we're gonna go through. So the first one is a rainforest challenge. I wanna to get to know how much you know about the rainforest. Secondly, we will explore the rainforest a little bit, which is gonna be really exciting. And third, we're gonna be talking about preserving the rainforest. Now, it is kind of amazing that this live stream is working from here below the equator in the middle of the Amazon. So forgive me if it gets a little choppy, what we're gonna do our best today. Now, one thing I wanted to say is where I am. I am in Tambopata, Peru. Southeastern Peru, this beautiful area. And right when I got here, it was the day of celebrating the national parks here. And they've done an amazing job of preserving this incredible ecosystem. And it's so fun that you guys get to be part of that celebration too. Also, I'm staying with Rainforest Expeditions Lodges. Um, I go to their Tambopata Research Center to do my own research, but you can come with your family to the lodges and experience this Amazon yourself. So I hope you get a chance to. Let's jump into it. All right, you guys ready to explore? I think I'm ready. So first question up, what are some places that have rainforest? I wanna know what you guys know. So hit me with your answers. Okay, um, I'm seeing, I'm seeing, um, oh, okay, I'm seeing the Amazon. Yes, that's where I'm right now. South America, Australia, Africa, there's a lot of rainforests out there. You guys are nailing a lot of them, but get ready for the tough question. What uh, U.S. states don't have a rainforest? This is a tricky one. Let's see how you can do here. Is it A, Hawaii, B, Alaska, C, Washington, or D, Florida? I'm seeing a lot of people saying Washington, a lot of Alaskas. All right. This one may surprise you. So let's go through it. Hawaii. Everybody knows it's tropical. It's beautiful. In fact, they have a mountain there that gets more rain than nearly any place on earth. That's 
definitely has a rainforest. Alaska, surprisingly, guess what? It has a rainforest. Washington, it also has a rainforest. That is my home state. So I have a rainforest at home. And then I come to this rainforest for work and research and to be a scientist and run around and have adventures. So that leaves Florida. It doesn't have a rainforest, which is kind of surprising because it's hot. It's beautiful there. You think it's tropical. You think that means rainforest, but it has to do with how you define rainforest. And the way we define it is it has to be an area of tall, mostly evergreen trees. So uh, let's pan the camera up. Let's see if that checks out here. I would say we could check that one off. Those trees look pretty tall. Evergreen means they're green throughout the year. And it's an area that receives a lot of rainfall. Now today it's been really hot, really sunny, but we're right at the cusp of rainy season. So starting in a week, it's gonna be raining and flooded and that is what the animals need. That's what the ecosystems need here to thrive. So, and there's two types of rainforest. One of them, I'm guessing you know, this is the tropical rainforest. Look how just beautiful and tropical it looks. It's what you would expect from a rainforest. But then there's that temperate rainforest. Those are the ones in Washington and Alaska that fit that definition because they have tall, mostly evergreen trees and they get a lot of rain and they're beautiful and biodiverse in their own right and absolutely worthy of protection. I hope you get to visit both types of rainforest sometime. So here's another really good question. About 3% of the earth is covered in rainforest, but what portion of the world's species live in a rainforest? So let's think about that. Only 3% of all the area on this entire earth is rainforest, yet there's, we all know there's a lot of species here. The biodiversity in an area is really high. So is it about 3%, so equal land to species? Is it about a quarter of all species? Could it be half, or is it all of them? Okay, I'm seeing some people say between B and C, some people saying A. Okay, you ready for the answer? The answer is about half of the world species live here in the rainforest. Even that lemur you're looking at knows how great of a surprising answer that is because 3% of the earth get half of the species. That means an acre of this area is so important to conserve just the richness of this earth and all the things that you can study and appreciate. This is a amazing, amazing place. Now, here's another, we're hitting with some trick questions, but you guys are, a lot of you are getting it right. It's amazing. Which Amazon rainforest species eats a full 25% of the, all the greenery in the rainforest? So I want you to think about 25%. All of this green behind me, take out a quarter of it, and it goes away, what animal is it that does that? Is it leafcutter ants, little guys? Is it tamarins with their nice mustache? Is it the ocelot or is it the sloth? Okay, seeing some answers come in. I'm seeing some people say sloth, some tamarind, some ants. I think a lot of you have guessed that ocelots, you know, they look like a cat. They're basically a, a tiny jaguar here. They don't eat leaves. They like to eat mice and birds and that kind of thing. Sloths eat leaves, but there's not a lot of them and they're pretty slow. So they're not gonna be able to eat a quarter of this. Tamarins, they'll eat some leaves, but the answer here is A, leaf cutter ants. Those little guys are so hard at work. We were actually filming with some all last night and we were just getting passed by thousands and thousands of them pouring down from way up in the canopy all the way down following a trail, yes, a trail, they make their own road. Um, but maybe I just gave away an answer to another one. Hang on. Oh yeah, okay. I thought that was gonna be a question, but thankfully I didn't give it away. That's one to celebrate that leafcutter ants are incredible because they basically make a super highway. What we saw last night was about this wide, completely cleared of dirt in the middle of the jungle and it had little side roads. It was like its own neighborhood that it would take turns and go from this way to get to that tree, come back to the super highway, get back to the nest. What's amazing about these ants is they don't eat leaves, they eat fungus. So then why are they cutting leaves? It's because those leaves feed the fungus. So these ants are farmers. They give those leaves to basically an underground mushroom. That mushroom grows, 
the ants eat the mushroom. It's a crazy, amazing, complex system. And the ants are really important to bringing a lot of the organic material from up here in the rainforest all the way back down into the earth. So here's another fun one. How often do Amazon monkeys visit the ground? Is it regularly? Ever heard of gravity? Occasionally, they've got to drink water from streams, right? Uh, is it rarely? Pretty much only to eat mud or never? Monkeys can't stand her. Seeing some occasionally, got some, some people saying the streams. Well, the answer here is a really fun one. It's one of my favorite things about the rainforest. The answer is C, pretty much only to eat mud. Now, why would a monkey eat mud? Because for them, mud is full of minerals. It's basically like a multivitamin for them. It's something that they need to supplement their diet that they can't get from eating leaves or bugs or things like that. And monkeys aren't the only ones. Butterflies will drink mud. Um, macaws will eat mud. We're going to get to that a little bit later. But it is a behavior that you see a lot. And it's so unusual and so special. But it, it really goes to show how animal behavior has adapted to surviving out here in the rainforest. Now, the rainforest has multiple layers, and I want to get into some of those. So go ahead. Um, so the emergent layer is basically the highest layer of them all. Imagine a really, really tall tree that goes above all the other trees. Now, that's beneficial for the tree because they get more light than anybody. And a lot of birds love landing on them. Uh, you know, monkeys go swinging in them. Sometimes monkeys will sleep up in them, but it's also risky for the tree because they get exposed to the most wind. So not every tree has adapted this thing because if every tree tried to be emergent and grow above the rest, all of that wind could make that tree topple down and uh, that doesn't work in every tree's benefit. So you have all these different survival strategies out here in the rainforest. Now, the next one is the canopy layer. The canopy is, it's like its own ecosystem, its own world. There are species that spend their entire life at the top of a tree. There are tree frogs that live up there all the time. There are bats, there are monkeys. And also at the canopy layer, there's a lot of fruit from trees. And fruit is there because fruit has seeds and trees need their seeds to be planted. And not just planted, they need those seeds to travel to other places in the forest so that those trees can grow and not crowd out all the other trees. So how do those seeds travel? Well, some travel in the wind, but others use animals. So imagine a fruit bat eating fruit, eating some seeds. It flies away, it poops out those seeds and a new tree is born. Monkeys are also incredibly important. And the term here is seed disperser. Monkeys are great seed dispersers. Hundreds of species of trees out here depend on monkeys to eat their fruit swing to another tree, to another part of the forest and poop and plant another tree, which is kind of hilarious that monkey poop helps this forest keep going year after year. And I mean, hundreds of years after hundreds of years, we need monkey poop out here. Now, take a look at the canopy layer. I want you guys to look up there a little bit before we get to this next layer. Go on. Okay, so the next layer, I got something here to show you, is the emergent, oh, sorry, is the understory layer. This is the understory layer. This is where you get most of the birds going through and a lot of the butterflies and the jaguars. And this is kind of what you'd expect. And if you look around here, it's pretty dark. The canopy eats up a lot of that light. And because of that, you get some really interesting things with the trees. But I want to show you first what I got right here. These are two things that you find in the understory layer. One of them is alive and one of them is a stick. Can you tell which one? So I think you figured it out. This, that's a stick. This guy, this, some people may think it's what's called a walking stick, but this is actually called a hopping stick. This is a top of grasshopper with these really, really goofy eyes. I don't know if you could tell how goofy they are, but this is the most ridiculous looking animal on the planet. And it lives here in the understory layer. And its strategy is to blend in to the rainforest. So we're going to put it back in here where it can go on its merry way trying to blend in. But then we have another animal here 
that tries a complete opposite strategy. It is trying to be seen. I have to be really careful with this one, okay? Really careful because see how noticeable this thing is? I mean, let's be honest, it kind of looks like cotton candy. This is a flannel moth caterpillar. Some of them are bright pink, some of them are white, some of them are bright yellow. And why would they want to be seen? Well, that's because this thing is venomous. If I touch this right now, I would be in so much pain, I would probably have to lay in bed for days at a time. Some people say the sting from this is more painful than getting bit by a viper. So this is a whole different strategy of survival out here in the rainforest. This is something that says, hey, notice me. I'm letting you know, don't mess with me. Don't eat me. So on that note, I'm going to put it very far away so I don't accidentally touch it and end up crying in front of you all. Okay, now, another really cool thing about the understory layer is, look at some of these, okay? This is a baby tree. This tree is actually a species that's going to become an emergent tree. It's going to become bigger than any of the trees around here. And you look at this and you say, oh, what is that? A few months old? Tree like this? Tree like this? Like that? Those could be upwards of five years, seven years, 10, 15 years old. These trees are waiting for their time to shine. Actually, they're waiting for the sun to shine. And the way that happens is a tree nearby eventually falls down. The wind gets it, rain gets it. It falls, lets in a bunch of light. And then a tree like this says, all right, now's my time. They get all that light. It allows them to, to photosynthesis and to grow and to grow tall. And then they have their time. But some trees will wait decades until they really get their time. Um, is it just me or am I sweating a little? You know what, guys? It's the rainforest. We're having fun. This is actually one of my favorite parts of the job is when you leave after being in the field doing science all day, you are muddy, you're covered in bites, you're sweaty, but it feels so good to work really hard trying to understand this really amazing world out here. Now, the next layer is the rainforest floor. Now, I like to call this actually the final frontier of science out here. And the reason why is because so few people have studied it. In fact, if you took a single scoop of dirt from out here, people have discovered new antibiotics that cure diseases. Things like scorpions live in the forest floor. And actually, if you look at the venom of scorpions, there are chemicals in there that are curing cancer right now. So there's all these discoveries to be made, not just medicinally, but also I guarantee you that if you took a section you know, a meter by a meter down there, you scooped it up and you analyzed all the mites and fungus and moss and insects that live in there, you would find a new species. So it's not quite as exciting, you could say, in the visual way of, you know, monkeys flying through the canopy and swinging around. But scientifically, it's so fascinating that we have so much more left to understand on this beautiful planet. Now, one of the themes that's out here is that it is tough to survive in the jungle. I mean, look at me. I'm a sweaty mess right now. It is really, really challenging. It is so dense. It is so competitive here that all animals have to adapt and find their kind of micro ecosystem, you could say. Their niche is another word to say that. So let's take a tree trunk, for example. Um, tree trunk. So look at here. Every tree trunk is basically its own little mini ecosystem. Uh, there are some really tiny ants right here. I'm trying not to make them mad so they don't sting me. Oh, look right up there. Hang on. This thing is on a, a, a bit of a extender pole. Let's see if we can get way up close. So I'm not sure if you got to see it. You can bring it back down. Not sure if you got to see it. Um, but that is a wasp nest perfectly blended into the side of a tree, which, I mean, I bet you just this tree trunk alone we would probably have a hundred different species living on it. Just one tree, not to mention what happens up in the canopy. And then when a tree falls, we already talked about how important that light is that trees let in to let other trees grow. But the decomposition alone is its own entire ecosystem. There are species that rely on a tree falling. They have basically antennae or different things that can smell when a tree has fallen. They come from miles away and they say, hey, now's my time to chew down. And I think, oh yes, it's still in here. So we found this decaying piece of wood right here and look who's living inside. Oh, there's a bunch of termites. 
and we got this. This is a best beetle, a pasalid beetle, and some people call them a crying beetle. Let's see if you can hear it. I'm not sure where the microphone is, so I'm going to put it on a couple different sides. So that's Squeak. Oh my gosh, these guys are great. And actually there's versions of them that you can find in the United States. So this is a, a tree decomposer everywhere. And what's cool about this is this is, yes, they're kind of alarm call saying, hey, put me back in that log, which I'm going to do really quick. But also these beetles can communicate with their larvae. Their little grubs also have an ability to make a noise like this. And those grubs have 12 different words, you could say, to talk to the mama beetle. And we have no idea what those words are, but we assume some of them are, hey, I'm hungry. Hey, I'm scared. So who would have known that in a de decomposing log, there could be a family of beetles talking to each other. There's so many cool things. And again, we don't know what they're saying. Maybe you could be the scientist to find out. All right, back in you go. Whew, okay. So another thing that you get here in the rainforest is this idea of there's a lot of breadth, but not a lot of depth. Now that's both literal and figurative because animal species, you could say there's high biodiversity. There's a lot of species here, but they're really, really rare to see. The abundance we say is low, high biodiversity, low abundance. They say common species are rare, rare species are common. So looking around, we see a lot of species, but to see more than one of a single species is hard to do. So it's kind of, it's really rich in some ways, but let's take the harpy eagle, for example. One of my favorite birds. It's this giant eagle about this big. It's got talons that big. It eats monkeys. It eats sloths. So that's part of the biodiversity, yet they're really rare. There's one nest that's maybe five miles away from here, and that's the only harpy I've ever seen in the wild. So they're dispersed, but they contribute to that biodiversity. And then also literally in the soil, people think you, you're in the Amazon. The soil must be so rich and full of life. Well, we talked about how it's rich and full of that biodiversity, but when it comes to organic matter, the truth is, if you dig in here, you hit clay really, really fast. So there's about an inch, sometimes five inches of organic material that trees can use to grow. So for that reason, look at that, that big root, that's called a buttress root. That is a strategy that trees use, A, to stand up you know, really strong so they have a wide base, but B, so, you know, the trees that we are used to grow really deep to get water, get nutrients. There's a lot of water here. They don't need to go deep. What they do is they grow really wide so that they can get all of the nutrients here at the top of the forest floor. Now, one of my favorite animals I have to talk about because some people here saw it yesterday and I missed it. It was on the river. It's called a tapir. They're incredibly goofy looking. I love them. They basically have the nose of like a pig or a giraffe. They have the backside of a hippo. They're about the size of a small horse. They're really rare. They're amazing, amazing to see. Sometimes they will see their footprints, but you know, I'd love to really see one in the wild again, like that guy. Um, but the uh, other thing about them is that jaguars will eat them. So every once in a while, I see them with a big claw mark on their back. That means they survived a jaguar attack. I mean, that's surviving something. And the last animal I want to spotlight is the macaw. Yesterday we were out on a boat and you see that photo there? That's a photo I took at this exact same spot. There were about 50 of them, four different species, magnificent colors. You see what they're doing on the wall? They're eating mud, just like the monkeys like to eat mud. And why? Same thing. It's basically like their vitamin for the day. They're getting sodium, they're getting magnesium, all these things that they need to make babies. So now that it's rainy season, that's the time of year that they make nests and lay eggs. They're going at the mud crazy so that they can be really healthy and lay healthy eggs. The other thing I love about macaws, and there are some that fly around here, you might be lucky to hear them, is their call, you know, beautiful birds, but their call is like, wah, wah. It's, it's, there's nothing pretty about their call, but you always know when it's a macaw going by. And actually, that reminds me, um, one of my favorite things about the rainforest is the sounds. Part of my job as a biologist is I've had to memorize dozens of frog calls, dozens of bird calls, so that you know you could just sit there and listen, and you could write down, okay, I hear this species, I hear that species. So I want you to take a moment and listen to the rainforest.
tell. There's a zzz, 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 that's probably a, it's a Katie did. There's a whistle, that's some kind of bird. That's a frog. That was another bird. So there's some really amazing noises that happen out here. And actually, when I lived out here, one of the things I would do as a biologist, I lived, you know, way out in the middle of here for a long period of time. You know, sometimes you can't sleep at night because you, you got science on your mind or something. So what I would do is I would try to count every single thing in my head. I would say, okay, how many frogs do I hear right now? Especially at night, you'll hear a dozen, 15 frogs and try to go through a list. And then how many birds do I hear right now? And that would kind of help my mind just concentrate on things and just enjoy being in this rainforest. And that is absolutely one of my favorite parts about being here. It's just, it's a, it's a thing that you've learned to appreciate, not just the visual aspects, but you want to know how you find monkeys here. You don't look up at them. You hear a, you hear leaves crashing. And, and at this point I can know if it's a capuchin monkey or a spider monkey, depending on how hard that crashes on a leaf. And then you look up and you say, there's some monkeys. Actually, there could be monkeys going around here right now. Not seeing any, but I'll have my ears out for them. I won't know. Uh, let's talk about preserving the rainforest really fast. And then I want to get into the rainforest with you and see how far this can go. So if humans were to cut down a rainforest, how long would it take for it to be primary rainforest again? Primary means it's basically a really healthy forest. So there's all the right balances of trees, all the right balances of animals. Is it 80 to 100 years, 200 to 300? Is it C, 400 to 600 or 800 years? What do you think? Okay, I'm seeing some people say A, some Bs, some Ds, 800 years or more. You're right, 800 years or more. How wild is that? That, you know, when you cut down a section of forest, that's not just cutting it down for the next 50 years, 100 years. 800 years it's going to take for that to grow back to its richness. And the reason why is because they are so reliant, forests here are so reliant on just the mix of species. So let's say you cut it all down. How do new trees grow? They need seeds, right? How do the seeds get there? Well, we talked about seed dispersers. Things like birds and bats can fly over and lay some seeds, and then you got to wait a long time for trees to grow because the other important seed dispersers are monkeys. How do monkeys get in there if there's no trees? Well, they have to wait for those other trees to get tall enough, and then they can swing in, do that magic, pooping, and then those other tree species can grow. So it takes so long for that balance to get there, for the big old trees to grow. And like I told you, some of these could easily live to be an 800 year old tree, thousand year old tree. A lot of these, we don't know how big they really are, but, or how old they really are, but, but that's, that's something that we're working on. Now there's other things about the rainforest that I love. Um, we've talked about the medicine you can get from here. You all know about photosynthesis. You're all smart. You know that carbon dioxide is going into these, oxygen is going out. And Amazon rainforest really helps. And rainforests in general really help uh, create oxygen for the entire world. It's also the homeland to amazing people. There's a lot of different cultures. And these people who live here, they know this better. They know the animals, the plants better than I could ever know as a scientist. And I get to learn so much from them. And that is like, it's an honor to be able to be here with them. And there's a couple of things that I really like that come out of the rainforest. One of them, I'm, I'm not sure if you like, but I'm sure your parents do coffee. I got to have it every morning. That is a rainforest species. We saw some today. And then the other, yeah, chocolate. Who doesn't like chocolate? Well, there's some people that don't, but it comes from the rainforest. And do you know what a chocolate fruit looks like? It's called a cacao, and it looks like this. We took a little trip to a farm today to see if they had any cacao. And sure enough, this is what chocolate fruit looks like. And inside is something delicious. Now, I'm just letting you know, I have no idea if this is ripe or not. So it may open, it may not, it may smell bad inside, it may not. But we're going to give it a go because you know what? We're live in the rainforest. Let's do it. So the best way I like to open these guys is like that. Now, take a look. Ready? Ooh. The smell. People don't realize how good the fruit of chocolate smells. Wow. It's got this really, really rich flavor. And so you have all this, 
this flesh in there. And this is something that if this were the right time of year, I would absolutely eat it. And it is actually one of the best tasting fruits ever. But right now it's a little overripe. But within there, you can kind of see their seeds. And those are the seeds that you dry out, you roast, you grind up, you mix with chocolate, a little bit of milk, and voila, you get chocolate. So how beautiful is that thing? So I think um, before we get in here, let me tell you one really cool thing that I love is Rainforest Alliance. They're a group that certifies products from the rainforest. And this is one of the best ways you can help is to buy things that are done right from here. So on a lot of chocolate bars, they'll have this thing. We call it follow the frog. So if you look for this little frog emblem that says Rainforest Alliance certified, that means that chocolate was done right. Coffee, the same thing. Palm oil. There's all these certified products that can come out of the rainforest. And those are the good ones to buy because that means that it is done in a way that cares for the ecosystem and cares for the people here, which is really, really important. And then the other best thing you can do is ecotourism. Come visit here. When you come here, you're helping sustain an industry that, that celebrates the rainforest. It doesn't cut down the rainforest. I love this lodge I'm staying at. It's called Rainforest Expeditions. I've been working here for the last 10 years as a research base, and I've been bringing tourists here, and it is such a magical place because they do it in a way that you get to experience the rainforest without cutting down the rainforest. How great is that? And how are we looking? All right, Brian. Well, um, you know, Bill, hey, thank you. Let me, let me intercept you before we go into the woods. Um, huge thanks, man. This has okay. been fascinating. And I know we talked about, we want to push the envelope and get as deep into the forest as we can. Uh, but we also talked about what 50% of the, the world's species are native to the Amazon. Internet is not one of them. So before we send you into the woods, uh, we want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to get a, a selfie with Phil, looking at the Amazon, kind of a, a vacation picture to remember it by. And everyone out there, when, uh, when Phil heads into the woods, there's a chance we lose him for a little bit. and He's got to work his way back to home base. So uh, we want to make sure you guys have a chance to get pictures before uh, we send him into the woods and see how deep we can get and then also get all your questions coming. So um, I'm going to turn it back full screen to Phil here in just a second so you guys can get those pictures. Remember, if you put those up on Instagram, tag Phil Torres, tag Varsity Tutors, and we'll have those uh, handles up on a slide on the way out. You'll be entered to win a spot in one of our after-school clubs this fall and a butterfly net, just like the one that Phil caught that pretty amazing butterfly with there. So uh, without further ado, we turn it back full screen to you, Phil. But we want to make sure people get those pictures before it gets too dark and too uh, oddly uninterneted when you get into the woods. All right, you got it. God, Phil, as I say that, we uh, we had a little bit of an internet snag there. So let me go back. We lost you for a sec, but putting you right back on full screen. All right, we may have pre-lost a little bit of internet there. You're still here, Phil, but we, uh, we lost the video feed a little bit. Um, while we get you back, here are those Instagram handles to tag. Any picture from today will do. It doesn't have to be the uh, the one that may have uh, have just flopped a little bit there, but uh, we're gonna make sure we've got some uh, some video to send you guys off on the ultimate exploration with uh, with Phil through the woods. So when you're uh, ready to uh, to upload those those pictures. Here's how to do it. Some of you guys know of a drill and have been taking pictures through, uh, throughout the class here. You guys have also been asking some amazing questions, and uh, we'll get as many of those as we can answer there as well. Phil, we, uh, we, I don't think we've got your video feed right now. Do we still have audio? I can ask you a few questions while we get that back. Yeah, I, I can hear you. Uh, let me just confirm okay. something, that, that the internet's still okay. Oh, yeah, we, we're doing we've our got best you down clear. Right okay, did you try turning video off and on? All right, Brian, I can hear you. So hit me with some questions. And Excellent. if the video comes back, great. All right, perfect. We'll, uh, we'll keep you here for those. So uh, one big fan, a lot of people have questions about jaguars. Have you seen jaguars? And are you scared of jaguars? What jaguar stories do you have for us? Oh, yes. I've seen eight jaguars in my life. And the first time I saw one, I was very scared because I didn't know that much about jaguars. 
they uh, someone in the middle of the rainforest it was at night we disturbed it hunting and i didn't know if it wanted to turn and hunt me but i have soon i soon learned and i've i've since known that jaguars don't really hunt people you know they've got other prey that they've evolved to to hunt down and they're curious though so i've seen a bunch when i'm on the river taking boats around here it's been really cool because i get to see them on the banks of the river and they just kind of look at you remember they're a cat and cats are curious so it's really fun to have that kind of curious interaction where you see it looking at you and checking you out and saying hey what's going on over here sniffing the air but in general i mean they are just amazing they're powerful they're ambush predators and you know do i get scared if i'm out there alone at night i i sure do i'll admit i get scared but i'm thankful to know that the reality is jaguars will leave me alone awesome that actually leads to another that's um you know it's fascinating that you can spend so much time in the and you're so comfortable handling uh you know some of the, the the most painful sting creatures in the world and all those kind of things uh, just sort of a general survival strategy as someone who spent a lot of time out there in the rainforest i think we got your video back in a pretty good way here um what uh what do you do what are the precautions you take what what things should people know if they wanted to spend a little time in the rainforest how does someone like us survive in in such a crazy competitive and, and dangerous environment well, I wear a lot of long sleeves and long pants. I never go into the jungle without that because there's a lot of bugs that can bite you. There's things that could sting you. So being covered up is really helpful protection. I also almost always wear my jungle boots. You caught me at the one time a day. I don't have my big tall boots on, but I wear basically these tall rubber boots anytime I go in really deep because uh, they're, some people call them snake boots. They're basically something that you could feel a little bit protected when you're stepping into the jungle. The other thing I tell people is essentially don't touch anything. The only time I've been stung by a bullet ant, which is the most painful sting by an insect in the world, is when I kind of leaned on a tree one time. And guess who loves hanging out on tree trunks? Bullet ants. They're really big. It hurts. So I always tell people just be really careful. And the benefit of being careful and is that you walk slow. And the benefit of walking slow is you actually end up seeing more wildlife. So it's actually really beneficial for you safety wise, but also for you experience wise, because you get to see more, hear more, really experience the Amazon. That's great advice. You mentioned too, that, you know, there's, there's a lot of biodiversity, but not a lot of depth to it or abundance. And so you kind of have to be taking it slow because uh, you never know when you're going to see, you know, that tapir, that macaw, that, you know, all the different things that are out there and you'd be listening for the leaves to drop to see the monkeys. So um, I love when the best advice for safety is also the best advice for enjoyment as well. So um, we get a little bit of intermittent video back and forth. Let me ask you a couple other questions and we'll, uh, we'll be able to, to, you know, see if we can, send you uh, off into the woods. Everybody, thanks for all your questions. Um, if you do get a clean shot at Phil's video, want to get that picture, please take advantage of it. And again, excuse the internet. It's uh, it's the rainforest. We really wanted to push the envelope and see how, how uh, you know, uh, exotic a location we could take you to here. And uh, it's been going pretty well. So another one is people want to know about the rain, right? It, it's right there in the title. Does it really rain every day? How much does it rain? You know, you've been there all week. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, like what to expect in terms of weather when you're in the rainforest? Does it only rain in certain levels? Does it even make its way down to the floor? All kinds of questions people had specifically about the rain in the rainforest. Those are wonderful questions. Um, so the rainforest, it does rain. We're at the end of the dry season. So this is a season where it doesn't rain every day. Uh, today, it's been really hot and sunny, no rain. We had rain two weeks ago. And then we're getting to the rainy season where it will rain every single day. And sometimes that rain will be, you know, 12 hours straight. And it's crazy. And everything floods. And there's lightning. And other times, you know, you get rain in the morning for a few hours. It's really heavy, really intense. And then it burns off. So rain is absolutely a part of the forest. But another cool thing, and this, this is a really good question that someone asked, is when you're in there, if it starts to rain, it takes about five minutes for you to feel that first drop. Why? Because of the canopy above you. The rain is hitting those leaves. It's bouncing from leaf to leaf, getting absorbed into the branches, hitting some bromeliads, living in these things. And then eventually it makes its way down to you. And conversely, it can stop raining and you're in the rainforest, you're like, oh, it's still raining. And then you come out to a clearing and you're like, oh, it's blue skies. So there is this delay that's built into the forest. That's, that's just kind of funny. 
I love that. Anybody, I'm not tall enough for people to ask me, but you know, that, that question you always ask the tallest person, you know, what's the weather like up there? You can really do that in the, in the rainforest because you don't know what the weather is like at the, you know, the, the emergent layer and the canopy layer. If you're down there, that is so cool to hear. Just one of those other really exotic things to know uh, about the rainforest. Again, hey, huge thanks to all of you for asking such amazing questions. We'll run through a few more with Phil as we try to get the video uh, fully up and running so we can try to send them deep into the woods and, and get you guys up close and personal with so many of those cool things that we saw. Another like family of questions that came out, Phil, was a lot of people want to know about bugs, uh, about, you know, one was specifically, what was the biggest beetle you've ever seen? Uh, I think there's a question about a rhinoceros beetle. Um, we know there's a lot of bugs you mentioned, long sleeves, long pants, even though it's as hot out there. Um, what, uh, what exotic bugs should we know about insects, arachnids that, uh, that you see out there in the rainforest? I see a lot of tarantulas. I love them. Some of them are giants. They live in holes. Um, some of them even live in families. We just found one that had like five or six babies living with it. When I say baby tarantula, I mean, some of these, some of these babies were like three or four years old living with a big tarantula that was 15 years old. So that's a weird thing that no one's really looked into all that much. Um, rhinoceros beetle. Yes. I've seen twice in my life. They're a beetle that is huge, about seven, eight inches long. Half of that is just this really long nose that looks like a big horn and the males use that to battle. And one of the things we've been looking at here that I love are these things called orchid bees. They literally look like little jewels flying through the forest. There's some that are metallic red, metallic blue, green, all these different colors. And they're, they're small, but wow, when you get up close and we've got some really close footage, we're really excited to, to share with the world. They look amazing. It is just an amazing spot out there. Just so many cool things. To you know see. What? Thank you for sharing that expertise. Go ahead. You, you had more to say. Yeah. Um, you know, someone I'm with just found something. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Uh, hang on. Let's do this right. <laughs> um, look at that. Where does the leaf begin and the animal end? Are you getting that, Brian? I'm not sure actually what YouTube gets and what I'm seeing are slightly different at times. Like we're getting some, some decent still photos. Oh, there we go. Actually. Wow. Right on cue. Thank you. Phil. Let me go back full screen to you here. Okay. We got the leaf and then we got this. You guys, this is a Katie did. This is an insect that looks so much like a leaf. I really hope you can see it. Um, I'll definitely post photos on my Instagram. So if it's not coming through very clear, because this is the most convincing example of, uh, I mean, it looks like a dead leaf. It has veins like a leaf. It has holes. It has little notches. And it's basically a, related to a grasshopper. Now, the other really cool thing about this species, it's called the peacock, Katie did. And the reason why is because it does this like warning thing where it does, hang on, let me see if I make it kind of mad here. It sometimes will pop out, goes back. Hey, buddy, let me see here. So look at that, look at that. All right, so that's, when it gets startled, when it thinks something's gonna try to eat it, it pops this out and it has those false eye spots. So imagine thinking you're looking at a leaf because it looks like a leaf and then boom, it hits you with this and it actually dances around a little bit. And it is like really, really crazy, really cool. This is actually the first time I've ever seen one of these. So I am like thrilled that this happened to happen right now it must have flown into one of the lights at the lodge and and wow i mean it is i i think evolution is so cool because you know you get impressed by this because its camouflage is so good but you also got to be impressed by the predators trying to eat it because that means that monkeys trying to eat this thing their vision is so good that they can tell sometimes that this isn't a dead leaf that this is food and that's why it's evolved to be so convincing so oh wow I'm going to have to put this aside, get some photos later. And I promise it'll be on my Instagram for you to see up close. Man, thank you. I'm, I'm thrilled. We, we, you've seen so many things in the Amazon, but 
that we get to be with you for uh, for one of your first. It's such a cool honor for all of us out there. Um, I know, guys, that the video is a little bit shaky at times. That's because we are in one of those exotic places on Earth that uh, the internet doesn't always extend. So we're running some solar power and generators to, to make all this stuff happen for you guys. So um, thanks, everybody, for all the questions. Keep them coming. Uh, we may have time for uh, for one or two things here, and then what we've wanted to do the whole time. We'll see how well the uh, the video holds. We'll just kind of follow the camera into the woods, and, and when we lose connection fully, we lose it. But uh, we want to try to get you guys, you know, deep into the jungle if we can. So maybe one more question here for you, Phil. What uh, you showed us a few things. Uh, you had you know the great quiz at the beginning with some kind of counterintuitive examples and things. Um, can you tell what what's surprising about the rainforest? I think we all have these ideas about you know it's the jungle, it's a certain way, and all of those. Can you can you tell us one of the most surprising things that those of us who haven't been, but you've spent a lot of time there? Um, what one more chance blow our minds with one other thing that's just not the way that you know the the rainforest is presented in pop culture on TV, all those things. Yeah. Huh. That's a tricky one. You know, to me, what, what is surprising about the rainforest is every day in the rainforest. Um, you know, that's what I love is that every time I go for a walk, I see something I've never seen before. And every once in a while, that thing I've never seen before, when I talk to other scientists, it ends up nobody's ever seen it before. So that to me is, is it is inherently full of surprises, things that you didn't think were possible for a plant to do or an animal to do. What do you know? You find it somewhere in the rainforest. And that's some of the research I've really specialized in is finding these things that no one kind of thought animals could ever have the behavior for or could have evolved. So that, that to me is, it is inherently just so full of surprises. It's, it's really, it's great. Well, I think you've proven that to us today and then some. I love the point you made about, you know, just kind of evolution and, and adaptations. Life finds a way in, in so many cool ways of plants that don't need sun because they get to live, you know, on that ground floor and, and you know, and, and butterflies that find the cool camouflage. Um, and so there's so many great things to uh, to see. And thank you for exposing us to so many of those. I know you're there filming, um, you know, a TV show as well. So, uh, so we can check some of that out when you're done with it. And I know you'll be back with RC Teachers again, you know, sometime over the winter as well, uh, probably from back home in Seattle where, uh, where you've got, you know, Amazon Web Services internet instead of Amazon Rainforest internet. So we'll, uh, we'll have you up and running on that. So huge thanks, Bill. Thanks to all of you out there. I know the Instagram photos are, are already starting to roll in. Phil, I know our dream for this was to send you out into the woods and uh, and see what we see. So maybe as a sign off, want to take you know ninety seconds, two minutes. We'll just kind of wander in, see if the video follows you, and everybody wants to hang on and see that. We'll pop up the Instagram handles here in a second, give everybody a chance to win. But uh, let's see what what we get with video if we send you out there. Let's see how far we go. Let's go. Oh yeah. You know what? It's instantly cooler the second I step in here because there's not a lot of light in here. So it's just like beautiful shade. We've been talking in here the whole time. Wow. So you caught me at right at that transition between day and night. So I'm starting to hear a lot of birds I didn't hear earlier. There's one kind of mot mot. It goes, Boo big, beautiful bird. And that kind of means it's the end of the day. Nighttime is coming. So let's see what we can find out here. And while you're doing that, Phil, I don't know how well the video is following you. Everybody uh, listen to the sounds. Enjoy that. Phil mentioned that as, uh, as we try to, to see if the video picks up at some point or another for, uh, for those. Actually, it looks like it has. So we'll, uh, we'll turn it back full screen to, uh, to Phil here. But uh, if anybody needs to drop at any point, we'll see you guys back here soon. But Phil, let's keep exploring. Okay, we're exploring. Oh, look at what we got back here. I hope you can see this. This is giant. Uh, this big thing is a termite mound. Let me see if it's still active. Quick way to find out. Give it a couple knocks and the termites will flow. Okay, it looks like it is not active, but this is a giant, giant termite mound. And actually a lot of times there will be holes carved into this and there's a type of bird called a trogon that makes nests inside this. And they'll even make nests inside active termite mounds. So again, it's like this density of life here is so cool because this is growing on a tree. The tree is still alive when this termite thing was still kicking. 
and uh, you know, a bird could be nesting inside this. So there's just so many cool adaptations everywhere. Ooh, look at these leaves. We're going deep, Brian. We might lose you. That's that's the plan at this point. Let's uh, enjoy those sights and sounds, everybody, and keep going, Phil. Not sure if you can see, but these are some very, very big jungle leaves. Some of these leaves up here are probably six, seven feet tall. Pretty amazing. Wow, nice, huge trees over here. We are pushing through. Let's see. Here's what I love about the jungle. You don't know what you'll find. Spider web of some sort. Oh. This, now I'll tell you what, you're not gonna be able to see it because they're too small, but can you see that there's a big web here? Well, I'm not sure that's coming through. Now nah, we're starting to lose your audio a little bit here, Phil, as well. So let me, uh, we'll, we'll probably, maybe now is, is about the time to claim that, uh, that we finally lost you for good. Um, please do put those, uh, those images up on Instagram for everybody, because I know Come people want to check those out. I think this might be as, uh, as good a time as, okay. uh, as I need to remind everybody here of the, uh, the Instagram handles to tag, because Phil will have some really cool footage of his whole trip up there as well. And you've got an opportunity to win a butterfly net. Uh, if you been to other Phil Torres classes with us, you know, that's kind of how he got started on, uh, on these adventures was, was just exploring with a butterfly net. So if you enter to win here, you'll be entered to win a butterfly net a spot in a varsity tutors after school club, Phil, huge. Thanks. Keep exploring. We'll, uh, we'll take it from here. Everybody out there. Um, just a, a huge thanks for all of your questions, participation, all those things. We hope you enjoyed our, our tour of the Amazon. We hope to do it again soon and uh, we'll have a great night, everybody.